test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Today is February 19th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the Friday series of DDA updates with Bernie Simons, the Deputy Secretary for DDA. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There's a handout for the webinar, and you can find it in the handout section in the panel to your right. They can also be emailed upon request. We will be recording the webinar and posting the YouTube link on the DDA website. Questions can be typed in the question or chat box in the webinar panel, and we will answer those towards the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Simons. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> you can go to uh, the agenda slide, please. And so uh, I want to thank everybody who's on this uh, call again with us. Uh, you know, we've been doing these since uh, upcoming on a year next month. And I, I hope everybody with this uh, weather that we've been getting is uh, staying warm and dry and, and safe and thinking about uh, the, the, the folks who are not as uh, as uh, fortunate as we are, like in Texas, that without water and all kinds of things. So we should keep them in our thoughts. Um, I want to thank everybody for their continued support for these webinars and attending. And uh, today we're going to just do some uh, updates and that are, are critical to uh, the way DDA does uh, business. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, again, I want to thank everybody. You've been generous uh, with making these webinars uh, come together. We've had a lot of partners, providers, families, et cetera, who participated with us and I think uh, had uh, enlightened people to make some uh, good conversations and thoughts and and the way we continue to move forward and think about the way we are uh, doing business here in, in DDA with our families and our providers and our individuals and supports and our people who are self-directing and our micro boards, et cetera. And, you know, we need to continue to be flexible the way we provide supports. Um, this has given us, I think, during the pandemic, an opportunity to explore other avenues as, you know, we've talked about before on these webinars about, you know, using um, a technology, uh, remote learning, remote interaction, et cetera. So uh, as we continue, we want to keep that flexibility. And again, uh, please uh, practice social distancing, washing your hands, wearing your masks, et cetera. And I, I want to encourage everybody, since we've got uh, vaccines and we know we know that we're in uh, 1A, 1B, and 1C, that if you're within those uh, uh, categories, that uh, you basically will get uh, vaccinated, please. And so uh, as we, again, continue to move forward, I want to stay in touch with everybody. Uh, feel free to, uh, if you can't, uh, contact me directly to get Tanya Ferguson, my chief of staff, or uh, Valerie Roddy as uh, a director of, uh, of finance and operations, or Patricia Sestoki, our director of programs. Uh, with that, many of you know that, next slide please, that uh, Valerie uh, is retiring in, in a short period of time. Um, she was supposed to leave a while ago, but uh, was gracious enough to extend uh, her date. So I want to take the opportunity to introduce Valerie's uh, uh, replacement, um, Robert White. Um, and uh, Robert was hired, he began uh, this last Wednesday, the 17th. So he's got almost two full days uh, with us, uh, or two and a half days, I guess, with us. And um, my concern was that with some of the moving parts that we have about rates and, and moving into LTSS, et cetera, that there'd be a, a smooth uh, transition and that he'll be able to work with Valerie for a period of time. So Robert's got a Bachelor of Science degree in healthcare management from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Uh, he received his MBA, his Master's in Business Administration from Johns Hopkins Carey School of Business. Uh, and he's got a Master's in Health Administration from Mount St. Mary's uh, University as you know, in uh, Emmitsburg. 
Uh, he also has a black belt in uh, Lean Six Sigma. Uh, and he's uh, a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. And he's an adjunct professor. So I'd like to take the opportunity to, again, welcome Robert. He started Wednesday. Uh, he is uh, uh, probably drinking from the fire hose. Uh, with everything that we get going on and coming in. I know many of you have gone from uh, one job to another and, you know, we're great in the world of DDA using uh, acronyms like DDA instead of Developmental Disabilities Administration. And so, uh, you know, he'll be uh, a good asset to the team. So with that, uh, Robert, if you would like to say a few words. Thank you um, for that introduction. Um, I just want to say I'm very excited to be here. Um, I, yes, I've been here uh, two and a half days and it certainly is like, you know, drinking from a, a water hose, a fire hose. Um, uh, but I've learned uh, uh, probably 2% of what I need to know based on conversations with folks around the departments. Uh, but, you know, you know, my vision is to continue uh, to guide us down that glide path to uh, um, that that the department's been working on over the past few years, um, and to you know look for opportunities for improvement and uh, make processes more efficient, um, and really you know make everyone's job easier from a provider perspective, um, and hope in hopes that that will trickle down to delivering. Uh, efficient services to the population that we're here to serve. That's great. Thank you, Robert. So next slide. So uh, the state's next uh, mass vaccination site uh, will open at uh, M&T Bank Stadium on uh, this upcoming week, Thursday, uh, February 25th. And uh, remember to go and uh, look for appointments and uh and and register so that you you can get uh vaccinated at the clinic or call uh, 211 and uh set an appointment as uh, we move forward next slide please so as i said earlier we had we one a b and c and we're in one c now and you can see the vaccine distribution plan on this slide including uh, people who uh, are 65 and older, as well as uh, folks in special need group homes and our developmental dis disabled uh, population. Uh, all Marylanders of any age in assisted living, independent living, behavioral health, DD group homes, and other congregate settings, uh, uh, congregate facilities through Part B of the Long-Term Federal Partnership uh, and we know we've seen uh, some of that already and have heard uh, stories that where uh, uh, some of our providers have already been interacting with uh, CVS and Walgreens through the federal program. Next slide, please. So uh, the Department of Health has uh, asked each um, jurisdiction that has, and, and all jurisdictions have a, a health department to uh, vaccinate uh, one independent living uh, facility uh, a week and looking at uh, and working with a partnership with the local area agency on aging and uh, also looking at one congregate facility for uh, people with I IDD or uh, behavioral health uh, issues that are funded through uh, either uh, administration. And so we asked the local departments to partner with aging and the Department of Disabilities so we could uh, coordinate uh, that effort as we continue to move forward. And you can see the, the reference on the bulletin on, on the, uh, the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So there is a pilot and, you know, we've seen some emails and, and uh, from uh, the, the executive director of the Arca Prince George's County, as well as some people who live with uh, in in uh, the county, and uh, it is a partnership with uh, the, obviously the Arca Prince George's, and uh, looking at uh, the the uh, 
group from Giant Pharmacy that will be uh, working with them. That, and that starts this upcoming Wednesday. And uh, obviously there is uh, a link that you can see here that uh, people will see the information that the ARC has got posted on that about um, you know who's going to be vaccinated in uh, what order. Uh, and from our conversations, they're going to start with uh, people who are receiving services from the ARC of Prince George's County and then uh, roll it out to other people uh, within the county. And then the last thing I saw is they are also, and I think Rob Malone sent this out, that uh, they will be also extending this to some people who are uh, living in uh, Montgomery County, not just within uh, Prince George's County. Next slide, please. So, uh, Tanya Ferguson, many of you know, uh, she's been with us a few years now uh, as our uh, chief of staff is working with uh, the Maryland Department of Disabilities and their staff over there, as well as uh, our public health division to start taking a look at, or administration to start taking a look at what's the plan for more clinics. Uh, we know that, as I said earlier, some of the providers have engaged in the federal programs with uh, looking at uh, CVS and Walgreens. We now have a more local with like the giant that's working with the Arc of Prince George's and that we need to see as we get more vaccines, what is the plan to uh, establish uh, rolling this out? <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things that we need to do though is we need to think about, so we're rolling this out and you know, as we, we talk and have been are receiving information and we do on these webinars about the number of people who have tested positive and the number of people who have tested negative and unfortunately the number of people who have passed away from COVID. Um, and we, we track that. We also want to now start taking a look at uh, where are we with looking with and monitoring our DD community about vaccinations. And, uh, you know, I know that we have people that uh, only attend day programs or get personal support or self-direction um, that have not had an opportunity to sign up for vaccinations. So we need to continue to work and, and address uh, all of those concerns for everyone. Uh, we know that we've had uh, uh, some uh, agencies who have, in the Western region, as an example, reached out and not just did uh, vaccinations for uh, the, the people that they provide supports for, but also uh, people who are living in ho at home and uh, not receiving supports from them, as well as people who are self-directing. So um, I ha my hat's off to them. They did a great job uh, in doing that, and that was the Ark of Washington. Uh, if I, if there are others uh, and I'm not aware of it and didn't mention you, I apologize. I didn't do that intentionally, but, you know, I, I think we can see that we've got some movement uh, going on. So with that, uh, again, I want to start being able to track and take a look at what progress we're making with the people we're providing supports and then uh, get that information to Tanya, who is basically along with uh, Adrian Holloman, our director of nurses, to uh, two point people and dealing with vaccination and dealing with that uh, section within the Department of Health. Next slide. Adrian Holloman, you're up. Okay, thanks, Brenny. Good afternoon, everyone. As you just heard from the Deputy Secretary, we are establishing a reporting and tracking system to monitor um, our progress with vaccinations in the DD community. And to get a thorough understanding of the vaccination status for the DD community, this is what we will be doing. The providers will receive a weekly email with the short vaccination form. Responses will be utilized to assist agencies with obtaining vaccinations for their participants. These emails will be sent every Monday and responses are due by Friday of the same week. This is a screenshot of the survey that the DDA will be sharing with you next week. Even if all of your participants have been vaccinated, please um, complete the initial uh, survey fully with that information. Thank you. Next slide. Hi, this is Rhonda Workman, and I'm gonna share some updates related to amendment number three. This week, we shared guidance memos related to the family supports, community supports, and community pathways waiver, amendment number three, 2020. These amendments were approved by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services on January 19th. We've included a link noted here on this slide 
that is also accessible by going to the DDA website and clicking under our what's new at DDA. In our communications that we shared this week, we also noted that we will be conducting a webinar on next Friday, February 26, from 1 to 2.30, where we will review the guidance and answer questions. You can click on the link here, noted on this slide, to register for our upcoming webinar. Next slide, please. This is, these are links to the memos that we have issued. There are eight in total at this point. There may be an additional one or two specific to pilot providers or billing related items. But we do have um, eight memos. The first memo, memo one, relates to waiver eligibility and it provides guidance related to the changes in our eligibility criteria, meaning our family supports waiver in terms of it focusing and supporting children, our community supports waiver supporting individuals 18 and older, and our community pathways waiver, which will now be focused on supporting individuals 18 and older who need residential services. Also listed in this memo, includes information about the removal of the cost caps, in addition to discontinuing some waiver related forms that are no longer needed. The second memo is related to person-centered plan changes. It includes guidance related to the changes related to specific services and amendment criteria that affect our person-centered plan. This includes hourly service units changing to 15 minute units, Dehabilitation groups replacing our dehabilitation small and dehabilitation large groups in the PCP. Nursing support services replacing our nurse consultation, nurse health case management, and nurse case management and delegation services. And community living retainer fees no longer displaying in the detailed service authorization, but is viewable and accessible through the provider portal. Our third memo relates to virtual supports, and it provides guidance to receive virtual supports under the following services as an electronic service delivery method. The services include employment services, supported employment services, community development services, day habilitation services, and personal support services. The fourth memo relates to services being provided during an acute care hospital stay. This guidance relates to those supports in the acute care hospital only for the purpose of providing the person with personal, behavioral, and communication supports not otherwise provided in the hospital. These can be provided under the following services, community development services, Dehabilitation services, personal support services, community living group home services, community living enhanced support services, and supported living services. Our fifth memo relates to personal supports, and it provides guidance for the authorization of additional funding for two to one staff to participant supports based on a person's assessed needs. In addition, You'll see some information related to personal supports transition to LTSS Maryland and that personal supports now includes transportation as a cost component within the established rate. Therefore, a participant cannot be authorized to receive standalone transportation services at the same time as personal supports delivery. Memo 6 relates to dedicated hours to support more than one person. It provides guidance for the provision of supports to more than one person under community living group home services and supported living services based on the participants assessed needs and specific criteria that must be met. Memo 7 relates to nursing support service program service plan and it provides guidance for DDA providers certified to provide nurse consultation, nurse health case management, and or nurse case management and delegation services to update their program service plan for nursing support services during their annual recertification process. And lastly, memo number eight 
relates to coordination of community services certification and provides guidance for DDA coordination of community services providers to advise their next annual reapplication process will reflect certification instead of licensure for this service. Again, we encourage you to join us for our webinar and look forward to further discussing. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, this is Valerie Roddy. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to clarify how the accelerated provider rate increase of 4% will be implemented in DDA's prospective payment system. As you may be aware, the governor announced on December the 17th, 2020, that he was accelerating the 4% provider rate increase scheduled to begin July 2021 to January 1st of 2021. DDA's payment system operates as a prospective payment model as mandated by statute. The payments made, or the, yes, the payments made to providers in January, actually I think that was January the 6th, were already in progress at the time of the governor's announcement to ensure a timely receipt and included payment for services provided in July, August, and September of 2020. Unlike the payments that are made in July of 2020 and October of 2020, January and April 2021st payments do not include an advance. The rates in the, uh, in the legacy system are in the process of being updated currently. Next slide. So this is a chart explaining the, how DDA's payments operate in the prospective payment model and in our legacy IT system. So if you start brand new with the first year, the first quarter includes an advance of four months. The second quarterly payment includes an advance for that year of three months. The third quarterly payment includes what was earned during the first quarter of that fiscal year. In this case, it would be July, August, and September of 2020. The fourth quarter includes what was earned during the second quarter of that fiscal year and includes a take back of one month of the Q1 advance. The following fiscal year, which in this illustration is year two, again, there is an advance of four months, much like it is in the previous first quarter of the previous fiscal year, but it also includes what was earned during the third quarter of the previous fiscal year. This is important because it will be this payment that providers will be able to see the 4% increase applied to the rates. And that first quarter payment also includes a take back of the three months of the advance from the previous year's first quarter. The second quarterly payment will include again another advance for that fiscal year. It will also include what providers earned for services provided during the fourth quarter of the previous fiscal year. And again, these rates will be adjusted to include the 4% that the governor approved effective as of January 1, 2021. And that payment as well includes a take back of three months of the Q2 advance from the previous fiscal year. Uh, next slide, please. The accelerated provider rate increase of 4% has been applied to the rates in LTSS and were operational on January the 1st. The 4% was applied to the wages for each service to maintain the integrity of the new rate methodology. However, for those of you who are currently using LTSS, you're aware that the resulting percentage for the overall rate was slightly less than the 4%. DDA consulted with a rate setting firm to help us figure out how to make, how to correct this and to ensure that the overall rate also included a total of 4%. That has been done and those rates have been updated in LTSS. For any claims that have already been made, which I'm sure there have been since January the 1st, they will be addressed through a data package, a patch to capture the um, 
increases in the overall rates. In the meantime, if you do have a question, please feel free to reach out to Ron Peel. Next slide. We also, as Rhonda talked about some of the memos that we've issued, we also, uh, this time last week, posted information and guidance about ERA updates and retainer policy, retainer day policy. We also held a webinar on Wednesday to, to again, review the guidance and to answer questions. Um, there was, there were requests to extend timelines for submission of the ERA updates. There was also a request to extend the deadline for cost reports and DDA is looking at um, at those right now. Um, we're also looking at additional clarification and guidance on the guardrail. And as I had mentioned during that webinar on Wednesday, some of the questions are very technical and DDA may very well need to seek some additional guidance from CMS. But we are going to try, we are working on this already, and we're going to try to get you some guidance as soon as possible because we are aware that it does impact your work on the retainer days. Next slide. So we, before I start uh, talking about some of the numbers in the, the four regions, as we've been uh, reporting on, uh, I want to thank uh, all of you who have already started to have clinics. Um, that people can get vaccinated, that we provide supports to and your staff. And and I wanna thank those who are uh, exploring it and looking at uh, hosting clinics. And again, as I said earlier, working with uh, the DDA, uh, Tanya and uh, Adrian and uh, us working with the Department of Disabilities and our uh, local health departments, et cetera, about how to make this happen and move forward specifically as we start getting uh, more vaccines. So, you know, I do applaud everybody for this uh, collective effort that we're doing within our DD administration. So as of uh, yesterday, the 18th, uh, we'll report out on some of the numbers that we have uh, done in the past. So uh, in the central region, we have 814 uh, confirmed positive and we have uh, 1,183 negative, which is great that the negative is uh, a larger number than the positive, and that we have uh, 49 people who have uh, unfortunately uh, passed away in the East region, uh, 149 positive, 400 negative. Again, that number is a lot larger than the 150 to round it to or whatever from 149. And again, you know, with sadness, it's six people who have passed away. Um, the South region is 541 concern, positive uh, cases and 200 negative uh, cases. And we've had 25 people who have passed away. And in the West region, it's 354 uh, positive and 391 uh, negative and 14 people have passed away. Um, I think that we need to go back and take a look at when I said, you know, some of the numbers uh, look like the, the negative are, are much larger than the positive is to also uh, take a look at where we are with uh, like the South region's numbers, uh, because we know initially when COVID started, um, a lot of, of uh, DC and the Beltway and whatever were uh, a very high number of positive cases. And then the second area was like Baltimore City and County, et cetera. So, uh, we, we would expect that uh, to see some of those numbers being high since this is a cumulative number since uh, the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, for direct care, we have had uh, 383 positive in the South and five staff who have passed. Uh, in the West, uh, 195 positive and two people who have passed. In the East, 206 positive and one staff was Asked. And then uh, the central region, 648 positive and two people who have passed. Next slide, please. So again, the pie chart on the left shows about uh, the 17764 number that we have, about 90% of 
of those with about 9% that have tested positive, uh, as you can see uh, on the pie chart, which is about 1,952 uh, people. And then the chart on the right is really just a breakdown of the regions. And then uh, below the, the line graph, you can see the actual uh, increases that we have had uh, from the last time that we uh, reported. And so, uh, you know, obviously, I'm not going to read the numbers. You can see them. And this is obviously a, a handout. But, you know, if you're interested as a, a reference point um, on, you know, what we look like when we're tracking and what the numbers are uh, looking like or not seeing an increase, which is a good thing, or a minimal increase, thank God uh, for that, that we can uh, move forward. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously, uh, this chart uh, shows us uh, where we are with people who have uh, tested positive and um, the number of participants who have uh, passed away, um, unfortunately. But uh, thank God our numbers aren't that high. Uh, you guys are doing an excellent job. Uh, our providers, our families, et cetera, you know, again, this is just a long haul with you know we're in this 11 months and you know it's you know i don't know if anybody uh, i assume everybody's still following the news talking about vaccinations and when they're continuing to do trials etc so and and obviously uh, uh our department being the department of health has uh a lot of of contact obviously with the cdc and has people like dr feta who are assigned to us from the cdc so uh, we're good to have those types of uh, resources for us. And then you can see the uh, the pie chart on the right uh, with the 94 participants that have uh, passed away and the total number of people who have uh, tested positive of 1,858. Uh, again, I want to give my condolences to families, direct support professionals, providers, CCSs, people in self-direction, and, and, and people who are on this call and within the, the DDA administration family who have had family members who had, you know, didn't work for us, didn't work for providers, et cetera, but uh, people who may have lost uh, loved ones to this, uh, this uh, tragic COVID-19. Next slide. So uh, this is showing uh, the people who are uh, self-directing and where they are. Uh, and the total number of people that have tested a positive, uh, you can see is uh, a total of about 32 uh, who have tested positive. And uh, obviously, and there's been zero deaths. And that's well over 1,200 people in self-direction that, uh, uh, that we uh, provide uh, uh, funding for. And that they uh, have a good life with the way they're doing their self-directed services and and making sure that they are uh, uh, keeping uh, control of their own budgets, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, with that, we'll go uh, to the next slide and we'll talk about, uh, you'll see the dates there uh, to mark your calendars if you're interested in continuing uh, to attend these uh, webinars. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this over to Patricia, I guess, who's gonna facilitate for questions. Uh, thank you, Bernie. Yes, I do have some questions in the chat box, and I'm going to start with um, Adrian. Um, will DDA track providers' progress to vaccinate direct support professionals weekly as well? Yes, the uh, survey that you'll be receiving says the uh, direct care staff. It will ask, also ask about administrative staff and if you're vaccinating families or other folks. So it does, it's kind of comprehensive, but it's short. It only takes about five minutes to complete. Thank you, Adrian. Um, the next question is for Valerie. Uh, will the extra money that was given to residential agencies for individuals to stay home during the pandemic stop next month? No, you know, that the additional um, funding for, you know, for staff to stay during the day, because again, the day and employment services, um, you know, have been impacted by COVID. Um, that is all part of appendix uh, a K. So as long as the 
public health emergency continues, and certainly until you know we start to get to a point of recovering, you know those payments will continue. Uh, there is, it it will not expire next month. Okay. Um, the next one is for you, and I know you you had a slot on this, but I think people want to just get a verification. Will um, an FAQ be sent out for the um, meeting, the webinar that will be held on 2-17-21, which was the uh, retainer payment? Valerie. Oops, I'm sorry, Patricia, what was the question? I, I thought it sounded more like a statement. I'm trying to understand. Well, no, they wanted to make sure, they want to know, will an FAQ be out soon for the oh, meeting? Okay. I am sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, got it. Yes, you know, this is sort of what I had mentioned too, because there were some questions that came up, as I said, especially around the attestation that were very technical. Um, so we are working on that. Um, you know, I'm hoping that we can put something out by the end of next week, um, because we know that this is impacts how providers will be doing their error updates. Um, but as I have indicated, some of those questions are very technical. And so uh, we may need to go back to CMS and get additional guidance. And also those FAQs certainly would address um, any changes in the timelines. Great, thank you, Valerie. Uh, this one is for Tanya Ferguson. How can they programs um, only providers set up? A, how can we help providers? How can they program uh, providers help to set up clinics for vaccines? And uh, we would like to support our, our individuals that are living at home with family and do not have access to the clinics. Um, and so, um, if providers are available or providers want to hold clinics, well, who should they contact or what should they do? Yes, thank you, Patricia, for that question. Um, you can definitely contact me, Tanya, T-O-N-I-A, dot Ferguson at Maryland.gov. Let me know your interest. Once we get through the ARC Prince George's County Clinic, we will be then looking at our environmental scan to see what clinics are possibly next. So I would love to know folks' interest, and you can definitely share um, your interest with me. As other providers, I've been I'm now getting emails regarding wanting to set up clinics. So we're excited about that. Okay. Um, this one is for you, Valerie. Uh, will LTSS eventually allow for an alternative EVV vendor to capture Quadki and Quacar instead of ISIS? So as folks may know that the ISAS system is operated and maintained by Medicaid. Um, I do know that Medicaid is looking towards the future to look at alternatives, but at this point, um, it, the ISAS is in place, and that's what we'll be continued to use. I don't have any updates about anything different from Medicaid at this point, but they are looking at maybe better ways to facilitate this requirement. All right, thank you. Um, and this one, Tanya, is for you. Um, is DDA working to get unpaid family members who live with people in services designated in a priority vaccine phase? Uh, so far, only the paid DSPs have been prioritized. Absolutely, DDA is collaborating with MDLD. I actually um, sent a uh, email about couple of days ago, just also sharing concerns that I had received in email from family members that um, want to ensure that caregivers under 65 are included in the priority group. So yes, we are definitely advocating um, for that. And if there's anyone on the call that um, has a story you wanna share, I wanna keep pushing that up to um, the secretary level so they hear the concerns of our caregivers. Thank you. Um, Valerie, this one's for you. Um, for clarification, will there be a 4% increased payment provided for January payment? And will we see the increase in May? No. Um, 
because as I explained, um, going back to the chart, um, I think it was on slide. I done. I go bring this fourteen. Fourteen. Yes, I thought it was fourteen. Donna, can you pull up slide 14, please? Thank you. Okay. This is a delay. So, great. Thank you. So, the third quarterly payment that was paid on January 6, 2021, included a payment for services provided in July, August, and September of 2020. So, that payment like it always is, is based on the rates in place and effective at the time services are provided. So there would be no 4% on that particular payment because it was prior to the effective date of the accelerated provider rate increase. Okay. Um, and then there was a comment while we were on this slide, somebody said year one, Year one, second quarter looks like it should be year one, not two. Oh, well, they are correct. So <laughs> I've spent too much time looking at this chart. They are correct. It should be year one advance. My mistake. Okay. And this is more of a statement, um, not a question, but I'm going to just read it out for full transparency in this call. On last week, I attended a national platform on reopening and there were 10 other participants from Maryland. They all reported that they feel as if DDA has failed to give clear, concise direction to date providers on how to or way to move forward on reopening. May you address the, the concern. Providers are desperately seeking direction as families and caregivers are pushing day program to open in spite of an increase in the number of COVID individuals in our population. Um, thank you so much for this comment and feedback. Uh, the DDA has um, um, been working at the local levels with the DDA regional offices where the, the regional directors are holding meetings with family members, providers, um, and, and people in services as to better ways in thinking of how to reopen, what to consider. Uh, we are also have been invited to People on the Go. Dr. Harvard Mill is going to be asking people in services, what should we be considering, what to look for uh, as we reopen? And I think she uh, is doing this March 5th or 6th uh, for People on the Go. And Bernie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that statement. Well, I think we've got some guidance out there and have talked about reopening um, uh, with the uh, state DD directors uh, document as well as the American Academy of, of uh, uh, Physician, Developmental Physicians and uh, Dentists uh, uh, that is uh, based out of, I believe, New Jersey, uh, talking about aspects to reopen uh, and what we're doing. Um, you know, realize that DDA is a funder and um you know the the executive directors and the agencies report to a board of directors uh, i don't mean that like i'm ducking the question but they have the legal responsibility for the agency um i know that people are concerned about reopening what does it look like uh people want to get out from being within the uh, the house that they were now and do different uh, activities uh, i can tell you that when i started this conversation early on i was criticized for even thinking about having a discussion about reopening uh, versus uh, having people stay safe and uh, sheltered in place, for lack of a better term. So, you know, to a, to a certain point, we're not going to please everybody. Uh, we will continue to work, though, at with the regions. And I think the regional directors and the deputy directors in the regions have done a good job working with the providers and having those discussions about what does it look like for reopening uh, and, you know, people do it uh, gradually. Um, I would hope that uh, the providers would continue to engage with the families and that uh, at least uh, that they are doing day services for their uh, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, et cetera, because they are living at home and coming to a day and the day's not reopening. I think that uh, they, I encourage all of the providers to continue uh, a healthy uh, dialogue and discussion and and listening to the concerns of uh, the people's families who they're providing support to. 
Thank you, Bernie, uh, for that. Um, the next one is for you, Valerie. Uh, when will PCIS update the money that will be spended? Right now, PCIS just shows that the payment ends next month. And that's in addition to the, the first question that I asked. Okay, great. Yes, we were in the we're updating a number of things at the moment, and that is one of the things we're updating. So that will change. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one, um, and this one is um, is DDA considering the requirements that when the day center open again, that they close for fourteen days if someone tests positive for COVID and other has COVID like symptoms. Um, I think that, again, we had some guidance that we put out. We are revisiting those guidance. We're going to be talking to the regional directors. We are going to be engaging Dr. Fetter's consultation on that, and we will be updating that. So please stay tuned. Uh, these are really good questions for us to provide some additional guidance and support. Um, and then um, I don't have any more questions in the chat box. There are just a couple of statements about reopening must be driven only by safety, the safety of people. Um, and let's see, I don't have, um, oh, there's one question here. Um, and this is for um, Valerie. And this one says, um, this one says has, um, consideration been given to the limit of 250 days of services. Now um, we have some individuals that are asking for services on weekends and could potentially be 250 annual days before the fiscal year is over. All right, so um, the 250 operating days is around day they have. Patricia, did you wanna add something? I, I did before uh, you answer, Valerie, is, is that, you know, rehabilitation and the services under that are very specific to an activity based on the service definition. So we would need to know what is it that you would be doing on the weekends that would not be an other service like personal supports. And so, um, and also, you know, that would be my first answer to that, Valerie. I don't know if you wanted to add to that or if what if Rhonda wanted to add with what's in the waiver and what's been approved. Yeah. No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Patricia. This is Rhonda. Uh, I would just add that the waiver program specifies that day habilitation is Monday through Friday. So if you look into the waiver application under limitations, it specifically states the service is available Monday through Friday. It's a great question. I'm so glad it was brought up because I think with COVID and people being at home and people trying to figure out how to support people, you're trying to get innovative. Uh, and I think that's great that we want to make sure that you don't do something that later on you get audited and then have to um, pay back money that you were not that, you know, properly used. So great question. Um, and this one is for uh, you, Adrian. Uh, will providers need to report on clients who are vaccinated on on the monthly survey? So yes, the initial survey, we want you to um, put all of the information so that when we track, we'll have a, um, the information of how many direct care staff you vaccinated, how many administrative staff, or even if it's 100%, we just want to know the breakdown. And after that, the survey is simple because the first question says, are there any changes since the last reporting? And if there are no, you just click no, and then it submits. So you don't have to go through the rest if there are no changes since the week prior. Thank you. Um, in this one, um, uh, so this one is, I'm, I'm having a billion questions. Is there a particular department that can be reached out for non-payment of clients that is a DDA state funding? Yes, anything that has to do with payment that you have not received. Ja, um, uh, Ron Peely is the person, his email is in one of the slides that we have. Uh, so please make sure, uh, go to slide uh, 15 and you'll see his email there. Any uh, payments that you have not received. Valerie, would you like to add to that? No, I mean, that's, that's right. Please reach out and let us know because, you know, we don't know if a provider doesn't, has not received a payment. Um, we don't get that feedback, 
you know, there's no way for us to really tell because it, once it leaves the department, it shows like it's processed on our end, but the money actually is issued by the comptroller's office. So we do know, and we've been working with a number of providers who have, have missing payments um, and they are, we've been in touch with them and they know that we're working on this but if you have not previously let us know that you are have not received a payment then please reach out to us so we can troubleshoot this issue uh, thank you uh, Rhonda this one is for you um, are we not able to build virtually day service on weekends under appendix K um, my answer is no, you're not able to do that because we did not um, change or waive the requirement that it, it's only um, available Monday through Friday. So no, you cannot bill on the weekends for day habilitation. Okay. Um, I think the other ones are just comments. Thank you for this webinar. Um, I don't see anything. Um, I am going to ask um, so some of the questions that I'm getting in, and I don't want to call anybody out here, but there are some on nursing and self direction, but I don't know what the question is. It just says it's true of nursing supports for folks in self direction. So can you please um, write your question so that I can make sure I ask the team here so you can get proper guidance because all I see is is this true for nursing supports but I don't see the rest of your question on here I don't want to miss that out okay um any questions for folks on self-direction there's a lot of things here in self-direction and their budgets uh, please contact your subdirection lead um, and the contact for the subdirection lead was shared during the webinar that we had on the subdirection budget uh, last week. So please make sure that you go to that. Anything that you have to do with uh, your self-directed budget, please contact the regional office. Uh, and then I don't have any other questions in the chat um, at all. So, um, Bernie, if you wanted to end this or do some ending comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking <clears throat> at the uh, upcoming webinars and uh, on March 5th, uh, I just noticed that we've got a, a conflict. We have a, a budget hearing with, uh, and I think it's combined this year with uh, House and Senate. It's from 1.30 to 4.30. So um, either we're not gonna do it on March 5th or we'll be sending out uh, an alternate date because I don't think we're going to be able to do much uh, from one to uh, one twenty-five or whatever, so we can get ready to get on um, a budget hearing. And you know that's extremely important. We know that the governor uh, has given us a, a robust budget this year. Uh, we've seen that we uh, have got that information out. We know that uh, the ARC and uh, the DD Coalition has shared that with a lot of people. So. Uh, we need to, that obviously is uh, uh, a mandate where I need to be there. So we'll figure something out within DDA about either uh, not doing something on the 5th, which we obviously can't. So on alternative date, or maybe we'll uh, move it out to the following Friday and do two Fridays back to back and then get into the uh, an, another uh, alternating Friday. So uh, please stay tuned and we'll get something out. With that, I, you know, I again want to thank everybody. We've got a good turnout, uh, over 450 people who are uh, attendees today. Uh, it's really good that uh, people have interest, great questions, uh, especially looking for clarification or what does this mean or this is the situation I'm uh, running into. I mean, like what Valerie just talked about, when it goes out the door from DDA, uh, we don't track that because it goes into other systems. Uh, for payment, so and so, please reach back out to us. So, as uh, as Valerie said, um, we can troubleshoot for you. And uh, I look forward to you guys having uh, a good weekend. Uh, be safe. Hopefully, we get a, a little bit warmer weather and some of this ice melts. And uh, again, I want to welcome uh, Robert to uh, a DDA and look forward to his uh, 
transitioning and uh, and wish uh, Valerie a happy retirement. Have a good, safe weekend. Wash your hands, wear your mask. Keep your social distance, please, and be safe.